Thank you. Great. Um, all right. So um, we have started this practice of um, beginning our meetings with a land acknowledgement. We think it's an important part of um, centering ourselves in the physical space that we're in and also centering our intentions and um, around gratitude for uh, the stewardship um, that has led to our ability to be where we are. Um, so we acknowledge that Washington University in St. Louis is located on the ancestral lands of the Osage, Missouri, and Illini people who were removed unjustly and that we in this community are the beneficiaries of that removal. We honor them as we live, work, and study here in St. Louis. Indigenous peoples have inhabited Missouri since time immemorial. Today, there are over 183,400 Native Americans living in the state. Um, just a reminder of the mission of the SAT. So our mission is to create and spread a culture of sustainability across WashU's campuses through informative programming, community connection, and engaged action. Um, we also like to start with this practice that we have adapted from our friends at the Academy of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, and um, so they are being present. So we know we schedule this on purpose during the lunch hour, knowing that um, folks can, you know, be here in this space and also be taking care of their own needs. Um, but we do love folks to be engaged to the extent that they're able to. Um, we ask that everyone extends grace. We uh, all come from different places. Um, and this kind of also leads into trusting intent where, um, we're all here with good intentions um, and, um, you know, just being open to asking questions um, if something is unclear and um, trusting each other's intent. Um, we're also here for open dialogue and not debate. Um, there's this idea of making space and taking space. So um, offering to all of you that this is a safe space where you should feel comfortable to, um, if you are normally someone who uh, feels uncomfortable sharing, then we ask you to please feel comfortable sharing if you have something to, to share or a question to ask. Um, and conversely, if you are someone who generally feels like you take a lot of space, then taking a moment to pause to make space for other folks before sharing. Um, and then finally, um, if you are more comfortable using the chat instead of, you know, being on video or um, speaking up, then please do feel comfortable to do so. All right, Heather, I will let you introduce our lovely guest. Awesome. So I know that Josh already sort of introduced himself, but Josh is going to be our presenter today talking about um, implementing or integrating climate change into the medical school curriculum. Um, he is a second year medical student at WashU and originally from Michigan, like he mentioned. Went to Yale University um, for his undergraduate degrees in chemistry and ecology. His love for nature, along with religious beliefs, have fostered a strong interest in the intersections of climate change and health. He is the current president of the Student Sustainability Group at WashU School of Medicine um, and is undecided on his future, but is looking into pediatrics, OBGYN, GYN, and surgery. So Josh, we'll have you take it from here. Cool, thank you so much for that, um, that introduction, Heather. Um, I wanted to make this, so I'm, I'm like super excited about this topic and uh, I hope that excitement wears off on some of you a little bit, but I also want this to be a pretty low key and casual conversation. So if you want to ask questions, interrupt me during my spiel you totally can if you want to throw things in the chat um i i may not see those so if heather or amna could just like interrupt me that would be great um i'm just excited to talk to you about the beginning of uh, a project that i've been working on at the med school here um and that project is integrating climate change um into our medical curriculum 
I also apologize in, in, in advance. My computer has a lot of chronic diseases. So if things slow or um, we have issues, I'll, I'll, I'll try to react to those as they come by. Um, I am talking today, but this has been a project that a number of people have really, really contributed strongly to. And so I've written the names of some of these individuals down here. Um, and also some of these individuals are, are here like Heather and, um, and Dean Agard. Um, can everyone see my screen? Okay, awesome. So I just wanted to start with a really quick background about myself. So um, my background in sustainability comes from my love for nature. I've always loved nature. This is um, my girlfriend looking at a llama that we saw on a trail in um, Rocky Mountain National Park. And then this is me with my little brother, David. We're doing some hiking and fishing in Montana here. Um, and then just a couple more of some college friends. And I was recently in Montana doing some, some hunting with my, um, one of my best friends growing up. And then I also in college did a little bit of ecology work. So Heather mentioned a little bit of my background in ecology, but I worked for Colorado Parks and Wildlife for a summer in, um, in my undergraduate. And I helped a team that was trying to, well, here, here I am in a, the only creek in Colorado, the only creek in the world that has this subspecies of cutthroat trout called the greenback cutthroat and uh, working to to help that population, very bottleneck population. And then here is a picture of one of my favorite invertebrates. It's called a Drosera. It's a mayfly and it's a really good indicator of river health. Um, so it's called an indicator taxa. And so I did a couple of years of work studying river bottom or benthic invertebrates in, in college too. So I came to Wash U um, to do medicine and I started asking myself, well, how can I interweave my interests in sustainability in the environment and um, my awareness of the climate crisis into medicine. And I started doing that as, um, as a leader of the sustainability club. I started, sh I, I started hosting these, this course for med medical students, just like kind of like in a lunch talk format, like we're doing here. I'd buy food um, with, with um, our sustainability club budget. And some of these courses are on things like um, how heat affects different chronic illnesses or how does climate change impact, um, impact the spread of vector-borne diseases, um, parasites, or, um, or waterborne diseases, for example. And there was a lot of student interest in this. At the same time, um, I didn't see climate change being discussed at all in, in our curriculum that all of the students got. So I saw a pretty, a pretty strong subset of students coming to these, um, to these lunch talks that I was hosting, but not getting a similar coverage from our medical curriculum. And I worried that the people that were missing out on these lunch talks were, were missing out on a really, really important field that we we all need to be aware of as physicians. So I did a little bit of homework. I basically looked into our curriculum and tried to identify areas where climate change was discussed. And I found only three examples. And I may have missed some, but I personally felt like the amount of time given to climate change in our curriculum was was strongly lacking, given the importance of this issue nowadays. Um, so I think the first thing that I needed to do I, I was identify a problem. And then the second thing I needed to do is build a team. Um, I felt really small in this um, circle, being at a new institution, not knowing too many people and feeling like I had a big project to undertake here. Um, so the first thing I did was, was try to make connections. Um, and so I, I reached out to some people. Uh, Dr. Agard was actually one of the first people that I talked to about this. So I'm, I'm really happy that she's here. 
Um, and so this kind of like turned my little tiny person into a really formidable team that could actually get some th things done. We had people from administration. We had people from, uh, from the School of Medicine that have background in climate change and interest in climate change. And then we also had other students like myself that were really passionate about this. One of the things that I learned from the faculty that I had on my team was how you actually develop medical education. And it's a pretty, pretty simple set of steps that make intuitive sense to me. So first you need to identify a problem. I already did that. Then you have to do a needs assessment. You have to see if there, if, if this problem actually, there's needs to be fixed. Um, and so that's what I did next. And then you have to develop goals and objectives to fix that problem and fill the needs. And once you have goals and objectives, you can then have educational strategies to achieve those goals. And then once you actually have laid the groundwork, then you have to implement it. So you have to deliver a lecture that you've designed or deliver whatever curricular materials you've done. And it doesn't stop there. So once you've delivered the lecture, you don't just want to tap your um, pat yourself on the back and um, call it a day. You want to see how your delivery actually went. You want to iteratively improve it based on the feedback that you get, based on how students react to the material and how well they take it in. So I, the next thing I needed to do was a needs assessment. I, I didn't really know much about the integration between climate change and health. I, I felt like from my background in ecology, climate change was this really, really important issue that I wanted to make a part of my career. And I also felt really strongly about medicine, but I didn't know it was out there to um, integrate those two things. And I found a lot of evidence of the importance of integrating these two things. So first of all, the World Health Organization has um, called out that climate change is the greatest global threat, greatest threat to, um, to global health in the 21st century. And this is my favorite stat about climate change that I think really nails it down. And this is from NASA that the 17 of the 18 hottest years have occurred since 2000, since the year 2000, if you, if you look back about, about a century. Um, Adding to that, the healthcare system really contributes strongly to climate change. So if we just pretended the healthcare system was a country and compared it to the, compared its greenhouse gas emissions to the greenhouse gas emissions of all other countries, it would rank 13th in the world. Um, but we also pledge to do no harm. Every doctor does when they take the Hippocratic Oath. So these kind of conflict each other. Um, if you survey physicians and medical students, overwhelmingly, you'll find that these individuals feel like they don't know a lot about climate change and they need to learn more. And this is strongly disconnected with um, the results of surveying just the general population in the US. This survey in, nine, in uh, 2015 found that primary care physicians are, are thought to be one of the most trusted sources for information related to global warming. So there's a disconnect there. So that was kind of like my needs assessment. So yeah, we need, we need to do this. <laughs> I was pretty confident after that. Um, in 2015, a great number of health profession schools committed to training on health impacts of climate change. And even more recently, literally as I was in the earliest stages of wanting to design this curriculum, one of the most trusted sources of, um, it's, a, it's a portal for medical education or curricular materials. They submitted a call or they published a call for submissions for climate change and health curricular materials. So it was like perfect timing for this project. If you're from another higher 
or ed or grad school at WashU, or you're trying to integrate climate change education to another discipline, this is like literally all you need to have, I feel like, to, to get started on that. And it's that WashU Chancellor Andrew D. Martin recently claimed that um, they're expanding climate education across all disciplines. So even at the top, um, this, is a, this is a goal at WashU. So then what I had to do, I did this needs assessment. Now I needed to present the needs assessment and present a couple of asks. So this is what I wanted to do. It, I don't wanna go into the specifics of it, but really I want to emphasize asking nicely. Um, what does asking nicely mean? Well, in my opinion, asking nicely meant we offered to lead this initiative. So we didn't just say, okay, we need to have this, but we're not gonna really do anything about it. Um, I tried to present it in a way that was like, this is a big area of improvement for our curriculum and I want to lead it. And these are some of the ways that I think, I think I could lead it um, and, and have, a, have a strong plan for that. Um, and this wasn't something, this is actually something that Dean Agard really, um, really emphasized for me early on was was having collaborators. So I could potentially do this project all on my own, but it wouldn't be nearly as good. And it would take me so much more time. So using my connections, putting myself out there to people that maybe I was afraid to, to reach out to because they're, they're busy physicians, communicating efficiently with these individuals, offering them deliverables like opportunities to speak or publications if they get involved in expressing gratitude. These are all things that I felt were really important. And then designing efficiently. So in addition to having collaborators, how can I design this in an efficient amount of time? And there is a part of our medical education called the explore pathway that I thought was perfect for this. So we have about a month of dedicated time to complete a scholarly project. And most of these scholarly projects fall into four different fields, one of which is educator. So I proposed having this climate change and health project as a scholarly project that students in our program could work for or work towards completing as part of the medical education explore pathway. We ended up getting eight different students interested in this project and we put two teams together and we each developed curricular plans to, um, to integrate climate change and health into our curriculum. We presented that to faculty that had expertise in medical education and collected feedback. And then we fused the projects together. So instead of me just coming up with what I thought needed to be in a climate change and health um, curriculum, suddenly we had like 15, 20 people when you, when you added the faculty and all the people that were giving feedback um, contributing to this project. And what we came up with were a couple of things. Um, I'm gonna focus on this foundational lecture for the beginning of our curriculum because that is the piece that I've completed with my team of collaborators so far. And then these are some future aspirations that we're just starting on. This foundational lecture consisted of two things, pre-work in a lecture plus. The pre-work or what you had to review before coming to this lecture basically focused on understanding the cause in the planetary effects of climate change and how impacts of climate change disproportionately impact specific populations. Then um, the lecture plus consisted of two parts. The first was students could choose to um, uh, four different topics. They could choose to go into any of these breakout rooms with expert faculty. And then we had a lecture that all the students came to and that was on the environmental impacts of hospital care, how we can reduce them and um, equitable strategies for resilience. So making sure that the changes that we make aren't further, for example, further increasing health inequity. So the pre-work, these were the learning objectives of the pre-work. I wanted students to know the, um, 
the main anthropogenic cause for climate change, namely anthropogenic fossil fuel emissions. And I wanted them to know the strongest evidence for that. Um, I think that's pretty well in line with medical training because you don't want to just take facts for facts or um, listen to any study, but you want to be able to identify what is the most robust evidence for a disease or a disease treatment, things like that. Then we talked about, um, I wanted students to understand what the main planetary effects of climate change were and how they disproportionately impact minoritized in vulnerable communities. So I'll show you a quick few examples of this. To explain the main, um, to, to explain the main pieces of evidence and the most robust evidence for climate change, I actually just showed a recording of a climate scientist. And this climate scientist talked about how verified global climate models and the decreasing isotopic ratio of carbon 13 to 12 in atmospheric CO2 are the two most robust pieces of evidence for climate change. And I feel like if you ask most people on the block that information, even if they're like pretty well read on climate change, they might not even know that. And I didn't know that before doing my homework either. Then to talk about planetary effects, I'll, I'll just show you one example. So I talk about heat as one of the planetary effects of climate change. It disproportionately impacts children that are younger than a year and 65 and older um, adults. The, these populations are especially vulnerable to heat stress. But I didn't just talk about it on that global or broader scale, I tried to bring it into St. Louis. So people that live in ur urban areas are um, more impacted by heat than the surrounding rural areas because of the urban heat island. And then this is a map that we see pretty much on a weekly basis in our curriculum. And it's a map of St. Louis. And this area of St. Louis is South St. Louis. And this area of St. Louis is North St. Louis. And what you find in pretty much any study of disease incidents or um, bad health outcomes, usually Northern St. Louis is um, predominantly or disproportionately affected. And there's a number of reasons for that. That relates to redlining that was happening there that relates to lower socioeconomic status. I could talk about this for a long time. I also don't have really strong expertise here, but basically the same thing, we see the same thing with heat related emergency room visits. There are more people being affected here disproportionately more than the South side of St. Louis. I also talked about how climate change kind of relates to in, in is indirectly related to ambient air pollution. So in 2019, about a million deaths from particulate matter were directly related to fossil fuel combustion. And if you look at asthma in St. Louis, African American kids are, are disproportionately affected. Um, they, they have a lot more ER related visits. And if you take this same map, I'm just switching back and forth between heat and air pollution. You see that the same communities, these, the areas where the darker blue um, colors are, it's, it's a very similar distribution. I wanted to make sure this information was actually sinking in with students. So I designed a stumper two question quiz. First of all, I didn't think many students were actually going to complete it because it was, it said it was required, but in med school, not everything is that's is required is required. And then I also was like, ah, I don't know if they're actually going to pay attention to what I'm what I'm speaking about because um, there's so much to do as a medical student. But I had really, really awesome results. So almost 80% of students completed this two question quiz. And if you're interested in seeing the questions, I can, I can um, send those to you, but they average in 80%. So I was like, wow, I was not, I was not expecting that. So did okay there. Then this was that lecture plus um, piece that I was talking about. And I'll show you really briefly some examples of what I talked about. But I, the goal here was focusing on empowering students. So a lot of times when I hear about climate change, it's talked about in a way that is um, 
really quenches hope in, in, um, you know, inspires a lot of depression or anxiety. And I didn't want to do that for students. I wanted to identify areas of the hospital that have profound environmental impacts and then give strategies for how to mitigate or reduce those impacts. And I didn't stop there because it's kind of boring just to hear a bunch of strategies for mitigation. It's a lot more interesting if you can talk about how specific hospitals have already done that and how they've fared implementing those strategies. So I started with talking about impact of healthcare as a whole, and I brought up this health system in Wisconsin called Gunderson, and they've figured out how to generate more energy than they produce generate more energy than they consume their scope it's called their scope one emissions and my favorite way that they've cut down on their energy production is they collaborated with a local brewery and they converted the brewery's waste to methane gas using these microbes so i like that was the perfect example for medical for geeky medical students um, to get excited about this was a image that one of my collaborators found and we labeled all the different aspects of the hospital to kind of make this a little bit more um a, a little bit to to encourage um participation a little more and we had students guess which of these parts of the hospital were the greatest contributors to um greenhouse gas emissions and environmental waste so if students thought the operating room was the biggest contributor, I could click on the operating room and it'd bring us to a slide on the impacts of the operating room. And so one of the very interesting things that I've learned is that anesthetic gases account for approximately 5% of greenhouse gas emissions by the hospital. That was shocking to me. I thought it would be far less. And the reason is that a lot of anesthetic gases are really potent greenhouse gases. So one hour of this anesthetic gas during a case releases a proportionate amount of greenhouse gas to driving 230 miles in a car. Absolutely shocking in my opinion. And it can be, it, it can, you can use the, ex, you, for the exact same procedures, you can use sevoflurane um, pretty much every, for every type of procedure that desflurane is used, and it's a lot less impactful environmentally. This is a study that is ongoing at Barnes Jewish Hospital, where we're trying to phase out desflurane. You can see that it's, so it was, it was two relatively simple academic or, or educational interventions. They sent out a couple of slides that were mandatory um, that providers of anesthetic gases had to review, talking about how impactful desflurane is. And you can see that, that's my timer for 20 minutes. Um, you, you can see that desflurane use drops uh, very markedly from um, uh, over time here. This is about the course of a year. Okay, so I had some other examples, but I'm not going to talk about them now because I'd rather save time for discussion. But basically, this, these are all the different strategies that we discuss. In most of these strategies, we try to provide examples of how hospitals already have done, have implemented this successfully, kind of like the anesthetic gas uh, example at Barnes Jewish. And so I wanted to evaluate how students took this lecture. And so the first question I asked was, when we talked about all these strategies, how many of these were new ideas to you? And I would have figured that a lot of people would have said, you know, not that many. I was really familiar with these, but shockingly, a lot of people identified that most of these strategies were new ideas to them. And so this was, it was really important to have a discussion about this. Uh, generally, I just asked about their level of satisfaction. Um, oh no, my computer's about to die. I asked them about their level of satisfaction with this lecture, and people seem to be overall pretty satisfied. Um, I was I, I need to talk to whoever put dissatisfied to get their to get why they were dissatisfied and, and maybe maybe switch some things up to 
to appease them, but I was pretty happy with these results. And then this was my favorite one. So I, I basically asked students to um, identify how prepared they felt in these five different topics. So discussing the cause of climate change, planetary effects, healthcare contributions, um, et cetera. And I asked them how they felt before the session and after the session. Um, and I, I asked them both of these questions after the session. So they like kind of had a better gauge of, um, it's called a retrospective pre-post survey. Um, so, they, so they really knew after the session what maybe they didn't before. This was before the session. So one means like completely unprepared, five means completely prepared. And this was before the session and this was after the session. So this was before the session and after the session. Um, I wanted to highlight that, especially for describing healthcare contributions to climate change and opportunities to reduce these environmental impacts, those are blue and green. So most people were not confident at all in discussing these things before the lecture. And after the lecture, you can see almost every student is saying, hey, I feel fairly prepared or completely prepared um, to, to do these things. And then finally, talking about how, um, how participating changed students' likelihood of discussing these topics and making efforts of any size. And um, this is pretty exciting information too. So going forward, I wanna revise the foundational lecture. I wanna continue future development. Um, I wanna cement it into the curriculum and I have some thoughts for doing that. And I want to disseminate. And you know, right now, as I speak, I'm in the process of actively disseminating this information, but I, I want to go further than that and consistently return to the game plan. So I made these objectives like way at the beginning of um, starting this project. And when I was doing that, I had a, a strong idea of what I wanted to do. And those objectives can change, but sometimes when you're like in the meat of the project, you lose scope of those overall learning objectives. So returning to that, making sure they still um, hold true is, is really important in my opinion. So thank you all for listening. and. Um, I, I really appreciate the time, Amna and Heather, and excited to answer any questions if, um, if anybody has them. We have a pretty informal question asking um, session. So if you have a question or just a comment, feel free to come off um, mute or type something in the chat. We would love to hear. This is incredibly impressive. Yeah. I'm, I'm astounded. Um, the reason I'm here is I wanted to, I'm curious about what, what you built and I love at the end, you say you wanna disseminate. Um, I think that the other professions in our collaboration would be very interested in participating, pulling this into their curricula. Thank you so much. I'm actually, so um, I'm working with, I just met Dr. Bakshi um, they work at the OT school and they're currently planning a integration of climate change that that's a little different from the way that I've done it, but we're certainly, our goal is to collaborate from the very beginning and not overstep on what the other person's doing or replicate the work unnecessarily and, and learn from each other. So we're really excited about that collaboration, but also really interested in, um, collaborating with any other health profession schools here and elsewhere that that would be interested in this. Th thank, thanks, Heather. Yeah, I think um, I'll reach out to you separately. I think it would be re really interesting if you presented to our curriculum and assessment committee that contains members from all of our professions. I, I would love to, thanks. And we are, um... Obviously, we're recording this and we'll be sending it out to everyone on our sustainability action team listserv, which is quite a lot of people. So hopefully um, those who weren't able to attend today will be watching the recording. Um, if no one else, does anyone have else have questions? Um, so as you were doing your research, because um, that 
it kind of like stuck out at me that you said that um I don't remember what it was called but kind of the platform that does the curriculum mm -hmm. stuff um they put out a call for like you know ideas and have you discovered through your process that anyone is already like excelling in this space or has produced something um I would just be curious to know like who else is working on this that's a really 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 great question and the last thing that I wanted to do was just replicate what some other group already did because that would be a waste of my time um and I probably wouldn't do it as well as whatever expert um had already done that so um there are a couple schools that are working on these in doing things in similar or different forms. So UCSF, for example, has a module on climate change. Um, and then um, the, I forget what the med school is associated with Cleveland Clinic, but they also are um, working on a, like a broad scale climate integration like this. And I met with them very early on in the project to get their thoughts and share what my thoughts were. but all of us are kind of like starting to integrate in there from what I have, from my investigation so far, there aren't any published robust um, climate curriculums that, that do the sort of thing that, that I'm working on. And I think we're kind of all working at the same, you know, in, in the same time. So I think what's going to happen is maybe in a year or two, there's going to be like four or five really interesting ways of doing that. And so I've tried to communicate and reach out to people that are, are doing that, but um, not, not much besides that. There are a couple published examples of um, integration projects like this, and the, the outcomes weren't that strong. Um, so I tried to learn from some of the areas that they identified weren't um, strengths in their project to kind of um, increase the robustness of mine. That's amazing. Um, I would also say med, so med ed portal and some of those other things, if you submit it to that, um, it's like a pretty awesome achievement. So that's, that's been something that I always tell people when I reach out to ask about um, getting involved in this project. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to do the best I can to submit this um, these curricular materials to MedEd Portal in a couple of years, and you would be part of that project. And that increases excitement for collaborating um, a lot more than just simply asking, hey, can you give a talk on this, like a one-time talk? Yeah, it really feels like one of those things that would be an item of like great distinction for the university. So it's, it's really, really it's amazing that you're spending the time and taking the time to do this on top of everything else that is expected of you as a medical Thank student. It's, Thank it's, you. it's really inspiring and, and so cool to see. It's like one of the few things that keeps me up at night with like excited energy. Like, you know, that like I can't, I can't, stay, I can't fall asleep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so does... Does anyone else have any questions that they wanted to? I have a quick question. And Josh, I know that we've talked about this before separately, um, but now that Dean Agard is here as well. So once you're gone, who will be responsible for updating this curriculum? You have done such an amazing job and taken on so much. So um, I'm curious to know where that will live. Yeah, that's a really great question, and, and Dean Agard might have um, better thoughts than I do, but I, I really kind of skimped y'all on this slide um, because it was one of the last ones, but these were some of the thoughts I had about cementing it into the curriculum. One, we've recorded all of the, we, we've, done, we've done this one time so far, and we're going to do it again for the first years in October. Um, and so we're going to have recordings of this curriculum and how it's been delivered a couple times. So if somebody else were to deliver it, they could just watch the recording and see how I've, I've done it or we've done it. Um, in addition to that, for pretty much all the materials, my goal has been to put into the notes of each slide little scripts that you could literally just read off. Um, 
or go off of in case um, you're not very familiar or confident with, um, with the topics. That is particularly important for the next stage of my project. So the next stage of my project is going to be doing some research on the impacts of climate change on specific diseases. So how does climate change affect dermatological or skin conditions? Um, how does climate change affect a waterborne disease like cholera or um, campylobacteria, um, campylobacter? I'm, I'm still not very strong on my <laughs> bacteria names, but- um, You were right, campylobacter. Thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, but my goal with this project is not to create a whole new lecture with that material, but identify lectures that already talk about that material and then just integrate like one or two slides on how climate change is affecting that currently. So I'm not gonna be able to like attend all of those lectures and give the two slides and then be like, bye-bye. So I want to design the lecture, the, the slides with scripts. So pretty much anyone can deliver them. Um, and then also offering resources like a paper on that in case faculty want to go further. And then um, also just like every couple of years or so, um, I'd love for there to be audits just to make sure that, that this curriculum is, is still being delivered. The, the nice thing about designing the curriculum all at once is I can have I can keep track of all the different components. So I have 60 different slides on climate change impacts of specific diseases. And they are here, 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 here in the curriculum. And then I have one lecture here and one lecture here. And in, in that all be contained in a single place for somebody to keep track of. Finally, we have a um, thread of our curriculum called health equity and justice. And I think um, it's, it's particularly apt for um, keep for, for collaborating with the leads of that thread um, to make sure that this material is, is cemented well. Um, I'll just add a couple of pieces to that, which is that, I, you know, I, I'm paying close attention, obviously, to this. Um, I'm super proud of what Josh is doing. And he, I think he is role modeling an intentional focus of the medical curriculum, the MD curriculum, which is around integration. So he's, he's demonstrating multiple ways to do that. The way that we run integration in the medical curriculum is we have thread leaders of content domains. So this particular area could be its own thread, but more likely it would be embedded in one of the other threads. And, and Josh mentioned hedge or health equity and justice, but the other place, we also have a public health thread. So it could also clearly fit there. And right now that's a little bit underdeveloped. And then it also, there are pieces of it that fit with, um, with health system science more broadly as well, especially some of the things that we could do in terms of impacting the way we practice medicine to reduce, to create a more sustainable long-term vision for environmental health and justice. So I think there's a lot of options there and I'm just sort of watching as it unfolds and then we'll we'll figure it out together, the two of us, where we um, where we leave this. Unless, of course, Josh decides to stay here, be a faculty member, and then it can be him. Just say it. <laughs> I fully support that idea. <laughs> All right. Yes, a question, uh, Josh. Um, what if we wanted to like? tell different people in our groups, like, hey, this is what this person is working on. Um, you know, I work for Becker Medical Library, but it's also part of OHIS, which is the Office of Health Information and Data, uh, Data Science. And so I wanted to be able to share to them, you know, what you're doing. Is there like some kind of high level piece of, you know, information that I could share to that group? Um, are you I, I'm not sure I fully understand what you're asking. Are you asking for like a small presentation or just like a one sentence blurb or what, what are you looking for exactly, Cheryl? Or just some sort of information. Um, I, don't, I don't know how it all works in the medical school. Like, you know, we're working on this new program to integrate climate change education into our to medical, school, medical school. I don't know if there's any kind of like write up or anything that's available. Oh, so, yeah. Yes. Jaria is actually um, writing a newsletter article about this project um, that will be sent out in the next Office of Sustainability newsletter. Um, Amna, if do you have the 
like I can I can sign up. Like, yeah. Yes. Um, and that will live on the Office of Sustainability website, um, but we could probably have a more permanent, we can discuss what that would look like, where that should live long term. The other thing too, Sherelle, is if, if you have, if you're, if you have like a specific audience that you want it to be sent out in and you're like, they would benefit from like this part, like the, the results of the curriculum or you have an audience that this we really want to know mainly about how this curriculum project was started like I uh, when I was presenting this or designing this presentation I, I tried to touch on a lot of those areas and also the like the actual curriculum a little bit but if you could ever use a description or a, a very short slideshow of um that's catered to your specific audience I would be happy to um, to design that for you. Awesome. Does anyone else have any questions? I'm going to very quickly, I don't think we have time to go through these. These are just like very quick announcements slash reminders about farmers markets on the medical campus every Thursday. A reminder about our community supported agriculture program, which we have gotten really great reviews about, which is very exciting. Um, we have opened up the Share Our Stuff sale to staff, faculty, and basic service contractors. Um, Share Our Stuff was the program where we collected um, unwanted um, move out furniture and things from students as they left at the end of the year. And so we are offering them back to students. And so we have some surplus items that we would like to um, clear out. Um, and then next week is Gephardt Institute Civic Action Week. And there's a number of events going on um, during the week. Um, and then there's the Take Care Health Fair, which is at the Summers Recreation Center on the Danforth campus on October 11th. Uh, Active Transportation Month events will be ongoing in October um, and keep an eye out for a challenge that we're going to be um, hosting using Washi Rides. And finally, the e-waste and paper shredding, the very popular event that that um, sustainability puts on with, is it Washi IT or Information Services? Um, that will be November 1st on the medical campus from 7 to 10, 7.30 to 10.30 or something, I think. Right, Heather? 7.30 to 10. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, yes. So that's, um, yeah, great. We fit it all in before one o'clock. Yeah. Um, if you have any questions, always feel free to reach out. Um, I'll put my contact information in the chat. Um, it's just my first name, at Whistle. Um, and Heather is hcraig at whistle.edu. Um, so thank you all so much for joining and taking time out of your day to be here with us. Um, we hope to see you in mid-January-ish for the next um, quarterly meeting. So thank you, Joshua, for, for taking the time out to present to us. This is so inspiring, so amazing to hear what you had to share. Um, so my pleasure. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Bye, everyone.